Hi, I'm Jean Kumagai, Senior Editor at IEEE Spectrum. Thanks so much for joining us. Today I'm speaking with Robert Charette, a Spectrum Contributing Editor and the man responsible for this month's article, The STEM Crisis is a Myth. Thanks for being here, Bob. Oh, thank you, Jean. Well, let's take a look at some of the numbers you cite. A report from Georgetown University predicted there would be about 277,000 job vacancies in STEM fields in the U.S. every year in the next several years. But there are literally millions of people who could fill those jobs. In 2009, for example, U.S. universities graduated 252,000 STEM bachelors, 80,000 STEM masters, and 20,000 STEM PhDs, not to mention more than 11 million STEM degree holders who currently don't work in a STEM field. So those numbers don't exactly line up, do they? No, and, and again, we have to be careful about the numbers because there's a lot of different ways to count STEM. The Commerce Department has a certain way. The Bureau of Labor Statistics looks at it differently. The Census Bureau looks at it differently. Uh, other folks like Brookings look at it differently. But I think if you take a look at, at all, all sources and you take a look at what's, what's being graduated and in, in terms of bachelor's, master's, and PhDs versus jobs that require those skills and you, and you take a look at those that are coming out of the associates programs and you take a look at ones that are coming out of the certificate programs, you, you do find that there are more people than there are jobs. And so again, it, it's this paradox of you know, what, what really is going on. If, if you have two to three times as, as many in the labor pool who are ready to take STEM jobs, versus the number of, of jobs that are said to be open in these fields, then you have to kind of question, well, why is everybody saying that there's a STEM crisis? So some of our readers have pointed out that if you just look at the raw numbers, it doesn't exactly account for the quality of applicants or for their experience. Uh, others have argued that STEM is just too broad a category to be considered as a whole. Uh, how do you respond to those points? Well, I, I think starting with the second one first, STEM is a very broad category, and and again, there are more folks in the STEM world and in, in the computer and IT community than there are in the other areas. Um, so it's it is a little bit difficult to to look at it um, as a broad brush. But again, policy policy is being made at a broad brush. They're not talking about just increasing the number of computer people. They're talking talking about you know, a, a, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of a million new STEM graduates over the next 10 years or less. Uh, so you have to take a look at it from a broad brush. But I also think in terms of quality, um, you know, I've, I've read some of the comments where they say, well, the reason that, that people can't get a job graduating is because um, they're not good enough, that, that the ones who, who uh, uh, you know, they in, in, in many ways they deserve not to get a job, which I think is a little bit harsh. I, I think the quality issue. There's always some level of folks who may not have the have the uh, the job skills, but I think that the vast majority have have those skills. I think part of it is is that employers want people. It's the proverbial, you know, we want somebody fresh out of college with five years of experience. And so there's there's a mismatch between what employers are asking for and what people actually have coming out of school. Uh, and what's interesting to me is is that for some reason, uh, new graduates outside the U.S. who uh, or graduates here in the U.S. who are from from uh, different countries, whether or not they be India, China, wherever. Uh, seem to automatically have those skills. So again, you know, I, I think the skill issue, uh, there may be something to it, but I think it's, it's in, in many cases, just a red herring. It's an excuse not to hire people when there's other, again, other forces at work. Well, so if there is no shortage of scientists and engineers, why would governments all over the world be spending billions of dollars to convince more students to study STEM? And why would you have tech companies insisting that they can't find enough qualified workers? Well, I, it, it's hard not to sound like a conspiracy. Uh, <laughs> you know, one of the issues is is that all labor, all, all companies and, and, and all 
um, uh, governments would like to have as many high tech workers as as possible because you know, they they are a, a generator of innovation and and wealth in a country uh, and having a, a surplus is is always good uh, but I think that uh, you know there's there's this feeling one that everybody is falling behind everybody else in the world uh, you know innovation is seen as the way of getting out of the recession if everybody builds uh, innovative products and can sell it to other people. Uh, but I think that at the bottom line is, and it's something that, that uh, at least for the U.S., that, that Alan Greenspan talked about is, is that they would like to have high-tech workers that they don't have to pay a lot of money. That, that the more you have, the more pressure there is on, on wages and, and um, the STEM community has always had a, an earnings premium. And uh, I think that, that companies would like to see that go down. I think if I don't think any tech company wants to experience what happened during the late '90s when all of a sudden they had to offer uh, BMWs and Jaguars and other cars as as bonuses to get people to go work for them, especially in Silicon Valley and in, in the IT community. So, so at this point, just playing devil's advocate here. Is the harm in encouraging more people to pursue careers in engineering? Uh, those are interesting topics to study, and at the end of the day, you have a well-educated workforce, whether or not uh, all of those people end up working in a STEM field. Well, I think there's I think there's two aspects, right? I think one aspect is is that as as I've argued in, in the uh, article is that we need to increase STEM literacy across the board. We're, we're not, we're, we're not going to be living in a world that's less complicated or where the problems are going to be simpler to solve. So I think that, you know, it would be nice to have, you know, the, the, one of the, the uh, stories on, that they referred to the article said it was a utopian ideal uh, to, to try to have uh, everybody become STEM literate. But I think that that's important. But I think there's, you know, you have to separate STEM literacy from pushing people and pushing students into, you know, STEM careers with a certain expectation that, that, that they're going to find a job uh, or the vast majority are going to find a job. And then they get out and they find out there isn't one. And then all of a sudden you end up with, with, you know the shortage that that you claimed was there, actually, which wasn't actually turning out to to exist. So it's you know what my mother used to say: "Be careful what you wish for; you might get it." Right. So earlier you mentioned that in the late '90s, companies did have to pay like high signing bonuses. They had to offer fancy cars to scientists and engineers, um, and they're not doing that these days. For the most part, they're not paying high salaries. They're not offering on-the-job training, uh, and they they continue to lay off tech workers. There must be some companies that buck the trend, though, aren't there? Yeah, there's there's some. You know, if you take a look at Netflix, for instance, Netflix uh, has I think 700 or or so um, IT folks, uh, advanced technologists who uh, they have on their staff and Netflix is a is a growing company it's it's one that uh, doesn't seem to have any trouble attracting any of its its workers because it pays 10 to 20 percent higher than what most of the other people in Silicon Valley uh, pay so you know we're not talking you know doubling of salaries here we're talking about a, a premium so if, if you want to get those people, you can if you're willing to pay, and I think that's that's the real driving factor here is that companies really do not want to pay to get the talent that they need, and so it's easier to you know cry wolf that that you can't get it rather than you know pay. What you also see is you see you know uh, jobs you know that are supposed to be so important going unfulfilled for a long time which again makes one very suspicious that there's actually any shortage at all. Quite a few of our commenters uh, seem to view the issue mainly through a nationalistic lens, how H-1B visas affect STEM employment in the U.S., for example. 
But the idea of a STEM crisis is really inter an international phenomenon, isn't it? Yeah, well, you see it in, in just about every country. You see it in Australia. You see it in Brazil. You see it in South Africa. You see it in Singapore. You see it in Japan. You know, it, it, it'd be easier to list the number of countries that, that claim they don't have a STEM crisis versus the one that they do. Uh, again, it's, it's this idea that everybody is falling behind everybody else. As, as I wrote in the, in the article, you know, what's, what's interesting to me is how each country uses the others as, you know, you have to be, be afraid of, of that country, uh, X, Y, or Z, because that's, they're going to take away, you know, our, our jobs. They're gonna, they're, we're going to lose our lifestyle because of all that competition. You know, to me, it, it resembles a game of, you know, you know, my STEM crisis is bigger than your STEM crisis. <laughs> so at the end of the article, you mention a different definition of the STEM crisis that at least a few of our readers seem to agree with. So what is the real STEM crisis? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I think a, a large part of the, the, the STEM crisis has to do with just general STEM literacy. You know, it's something that the Georgetown report on STEM talked about. Uh, others have talked about it. This isn't really a new idea. Uh, it's, it's one, though, that I think requires us to maybe reprioritize what we're trying to do in terms of national policy and in terms of educational policy that, you know, if you really take a look at it, if we increase STEM literacy at, at the uh, grade school level, at the middle school level, at the high school level, we wouldn't be having this conversation because I think we'd have more than enough students, um, probably, again, a surplus, to move into the jobs that, that we need. Um, again, people in the non-STEM community like STEM graduates because they add add value, they give a new perspective, They're, they have some pretty good training in, in terms of, of the uh, uh, ability to quantify uh, and, and do problem solving. Um, but I think, you know, it's an area that, that we, because of our focus on this, this crisis notion, that we're overlooking the obvious, which is that we need to have just a broader view of, of who needs to be trained. I go in, in our local school at the elementary level and at the middle school level and, and talk about STEM to, to people, uh, try to get them interested in, in science and technology. But it's, it's hard at these schools uh, to have any type of, of real emphasis because there just isn't the resources there that are being, you know, the, the, the government hasn't really put, uh, or, or the states for that matter, uh, ha haven't taken a broad brush because of the resource limitation they've opened up STEM academies and things but that that helps a few uh, without really helping the whole and and I think that we need to, to think a little bit more about uh, where we really need to be putting our our resources and putting our emphasis well I think our time is up Bob thanks so much again for speaking with us well thank you Jean and and uh, hopefully it'll uh, without having too bad a, a pun, uh, stem some more conversation about uh, the issue. Thanks, everyone, for stopping by. We'll be posting a recording of today's interview on the Spectrum website. That's spectrum.ieee.org. You'll find Bob's article there, too. The STEM crisis is a myth. My guest today has been Robert Charette. I'm Jean Kumagai for IEEE Spectrum.